small and uh, uh, friendly. So I will uh, just uh, briefly introduce uh, <coughs> uh, Francois and uh, Federica that both work at uh, the Polytechnic of, uh, in uh, Lausanne in uh, collaboration with uh, Marie Violet. And uh, today they decided to share their presentation. So Francois will start, uh, then Federica will uh, pick it up uh, with the second part, I believe. And uh, they both are going to uh, talk to us about uh, the scale dependence in the dynamics of rupture, fracture energy versus leap dependent uh, breakdown work. So Francois, I leave you the stage. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation, and so I'm happy to, uh, to present part of my research today with Federica, that is a colleague here. And today we will talk about the scale dependence in the dynamics of rupture. So we are going to talk about earthquakes, and the first thing that I wanted to show today uh, to you is a distribution of earthquakes uh, in the Earth uh, from uh, 2005 to 2015. And here you can see that, as you all know, most of earthquakes that are here, uh, earthquakes bigger than magnitude 5, happen uh, at plate boundaries due to the uh, large-scale tectonic loading indu induced by, uh, by plate tectonics. So the problem is that we don't know uh, yet uh, where will be located the next earthquake and what will be the final size of earthquakes. And this is mostly because of the resolution of uh, seismology that uh, try to, uh, to uh, invert seismic source processes on some things that happen very far from accelerometers. So if I summarize uh, earthquakes, uh, as a really schematic point of view, as a really schematic point of view here, here you can see a schema of a fault, that is a straight fault, sorry, as the Saint Andreas fault that you can see in the background picture. And what happened uh, in nature is that because of the high pressure and high temperature conditions in the uh, deeper part of the fault, rocks deform stably uh, and uh, induce, deform stably in time. And this deformation of the rocks in the deeper part of the crust due to plastic processes uh, inc induce an increase, induces an increase of the stress acting uh, on the fault in the upper part of the crust where the, uh, the rocks deform uh, in a brittle uh, manner. And this increase of stress will happen up to reach peak strength of the fault. And when uh, we will uh, reach this critical stress value, the fault will start to break and our seismic rupture, that is a zip propagating along the fault, is going to uh, propagate dynamically, inducing the release of elastic strain energy uh, stored during the, uh, during the interseismic period. And here I summarize a bit the problem. And there is two main uh, energies that are going to be dissipated during uh, seismic rupture, during se co seismic slip. The first one corresponds to waves, uh, to the radiation of waves in the, in the medium at the rupture tip. And here uh, I wanted to show you uh, the movie of the radiation of waves during the Toku earthquake. So in that case is the body waves that propagate in the earth. And uh, all these waves correspond to the radiation uh, at the, the rupture tip and due to slip motions happening along the fault. So the second energy that is very really important corresponds to the uh, fracture energy, which corresponds to the integral uh, below the curves, the, sleep, the stress slip curves here in orange. And this energy corresponds to the energy required to propagate the dynamic rupture along the fault. And here you can see that it's related to the stress intensity factor that developed ahead of the crack during its propagations. And this energy release rate controls the dynamics of the cracks during the rupture. So it's really important to have an estimate of this fracture energy. And here I'm presenting a quote of the paper of Tengfong in 1982 uh, that where he was saying that lacking detailed knowledge of the rupture process, the value of GC is the minimum amount of information required for any meaningful modeling of the source dynamics. So the question I would like to address now is what uh, can we do if we know the value of GC, the local value of GC along faults? From a linear elastic fracture mechanics, um, if we know the initial value of GC along the fault, we can try to predict the different stage of the propagation of uh, the rupture along the fault. 
So here you can see a, a picture that presents the propagation of a dynamic crack along a, a given fault, and it's a numerical result obtained by Kurama Okubo and Arshabat in 2019. And here, what you can see is that uh, there is a critical nucleation patch that uh, allow for the dynamic propagation of the rupture. And then you can see here the co in color the particle velocity magnitude uh, at the crack when the crack propagates, and also the propagation of awful fractures during the growth of, uh, of this crack. So the thing is that if we know the initial value of GC, we can try to estimate, uh, for instance, uh, the size of a, of a nucleation patch that will allow for the crack to propagate, to start to propagate dynamically. Secondly, uh, here you can see that uh, if we know the value of GC, we know the equation of motions of the cracks, and we can hope to predict the acceleration of the rupture front uh, during the crack propagation. And finally, here uh, you can see that uh, the, the propagation of the cracks depends on the energy balance at the rupture tip. And notably, uh, since uh, if the energy release rate, so the value of G remains larger than the value of GC, you expect that the crack will continue to propagate. If it's becoming so smaller, it's supposed to stop. So it means that if we have an estimate of the value of GC, we can hope to predict the nucleation, the acceleration, and the arrest of the rupture. So does it work? At the scale of a lab, it looks that it's, it looks to work. Let's say that here I'm presenting some experimental results obtained by Sumaya Latour in 2013, where she was able to describe the uh, nucleation stage of instability. And here we can see that the red curves, this one correspond to the uh, location of initiation of, uh, let's say, quasi-static and stable propagation. And here you can see the red line correspond to the growth of the nucleation patch. And here you can see the influence uh, of a normal stress acting on the fold that seems to shrink the size of a nucleation length that is the final size at the top uh, when the cracks start to propagate very fast, let's say. And the interesting thing is that uh, Yoshi Kaneko in 2016, using retent state framework, but uh, computing, if you want, the retent state uh, formulation as uh, in agreement with, uh, with uh, experimental uh, properties of the fault, he was able to describe uh, the nucleation uh, stage of instability in uh, using retent state framework. So secondly, for the acceleration and the propagation of the rupture, here you can see the evolution of the rupture speed along a given uh, crack. So it's experiment conducted by uh, Ilyas Vetlitsky in 2016 in the group of uh, Jeff Feinberg. And you can see that uh, the crack uh, uh, accelerates as a function of uh, the uh, rupture length. And here also you can see a different acceleration that depends on the initial normal stress acting on the fold. And if Asha, he, sorry, yep. one thing, we cannot see your pointer. So if you're pointing something, ah, please you can just, see uh, my pointer. We cannot. Really? So just uh, maybe yeah. tell us which one of the. So yeah, the 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 blue uh, curves is at low normal stress, and the uh, the red one is intermediate, and the green one was a higher normal stress. And so if you increase the initial stress, in fact, uh, the initial uh, uh, energy available uh, trend to accelerate if you want the rupture front. So you propagate faster for a shorter uh, crack length. And you can see on the uh, right, uh, right panel that if you normalized uh, the value of the energy release rate that you invert from LEFM to the initial value of the uh, fracture energy, in fact, you collapse all the curves, and so you can predict from linear elastic fracture mechanics the acceleration of the rupture front uh, during its propagation. So this is why it's uh, really important to, uh, to understand GC, and so the final point is that here you can see the same experiment that they were conducted by Elsa Bayard in, uh, 2000, uh, in 2016, and here you can see uh, that they were able uh, on the bottom panel, so you still don't see the mouse. Okay, so on the bottom uh, right, on the bottom left panel, that they were able to induce cracks that propagate uh, for a finite rupture length, and they were able to stop the rupture uh, for different rupture lengths. 
And using linear elastic fracture mechanics, you can see also on the right panel that uh, they were able to predict the rupture lengths uh, that happened in the experiments. And this also using uh, the linear elastic fracture mechanics and the uh, energy release rate they were able to invert it, uh, during the experiments and the initial fracture energy of the, of the experimental form. So uh, here start a bit the problem. So it looks that uh, the fracture energy that we are able to invert in the lab is well explaining uh, the different stage of uh, propagation of the cracks along an interspinal interface. However, uh, what we also observe from this experiment is that at the lab scale, the value of the fracture energy, GC, is a material property that is independent of sleep. And the maximum value of GC that up to now we observed in this framework of linear elastic fracture mechanics at the scale of a laboratory experiment is buffered by the fracture energy required to propagate uh, or, or fractures along the intact sample. So it's a fracture energy of the intact specimen. While if we compare to seismological observations, what we observe is that using, uh, so defined by different hypotheses, it's possible to estimate uh, a kind of effective fracture energy that we call also breakdown work uh, during laboratory during uh, natural earthquakes. And this value of breakdown work, in fact, uh, can present values that are much larger than uh, the one we are uh, inverting at the scale of a laboratory using uh, LDFM, for instance. And uh, also, uh, the breakdown work in nature scales with sleep, so it's not anymore a material properties, but it's something that depends on the size of the final earthquakes. So this is the different uh, things that I will try to try to address today. So uh, the different questions that we will talk about is that what are the parameters controlling the nucleation and mostly the propagation of earthquakes at the scale of a laboratory? Is there a scale dependence in the fracture energy? And uh, can uh, the breakdown work influence the dynamics of the rupture front even at the scale of a laboratory? So to answer these questions, in fact, we divided uh, the, uh, the presentation in two uh, different chapters. In the first one, I will present you uh, what we can learn from six experiments in ROCKS, so the works I did uh, before to move to, uh, to EPFL. And uh, in the second part, Federica will present the results she gets recently uh, about uh, experiments we conducted along uh, analog interfaces. So here I'm showing you uh, the experimental apparatus I was using during my PhD uh, that I did with Alex Schumel and Raul Madariaga. And uh, we did experiments uh, in rocks from uh, confining pressure ranging from 10 to 90 MPa, so up to four kilometer depth, at also different temperature. And the result I wanted to show you today is some results that we get recently uh, and using, in fact, uh, strain gauges located at different positions along the fault, we were able, in fact, to track the rupture velocity and to uh, try to estimate what are the parameters that control the rupture velocity during uh, these experiments. So here you can see a scheme of experimental uh, faults that we are currently using. And you can also see that we are using acoustic transducers that uh, act as a microphone, if you want, to hear uh, the small foreshocks and the uh, uh, radiation of waves during experiments. And the experimental fault uh, is eight centimeter length, so it's much smaller than, uh, of course, uh, other experimental faults that we can see now, for instance, in uh, USGS or uh, in Cornell, or uh, what is doing uh, HG Fukuyama in Japan. But the advantage here is that we can uh, impose a larger stress and we can be uh, in, uh, let's say, close to natural stress condition. So what we do in general uh, is that we impose a given confining pressure on the fault system. And uh, after that, uh, we increase the axial stress acting on the fault up we reach the peak stress of the fault that induce a small uh, release of frictions as you can see in the top uh, right panel, for instance, or also in the center and the bottom one. And the larger is the stress acting on the fault, the larger is the confining pressure, the larger is the stress drop during the earthquakes and the frictional drop, and the larger is the seismic slip occurring during uh, stick slip uh, motions. So using the strain gauges that are located at different positions of the fault, so in that case, we had uh, six strain gauges, 
it's possible uh, monitoring that strain gauges, the strain gauges at high frequency. So in that case, it was up to two kilohertz. So we have a maximum rupture speed of 180 meters per second following the distance between the strain gauges and the acquisition rate. You can see that we are able to observe rupture front propagating from uh, fast velocities, 180 meters per second uh, in that case, to slow front propagating along the interface. And you can see in that case that uh, rupture front can range from uh, the 100 meters per second to the centimeter per second, which means that at the scale of a laboratory, if we change the initial conditions along the experimental fault, we can, uh, we can simulate different kinds of sleep fronts that exist in nature, for instance, slow sleep events, uh, slow ruptures, or uh, fast uh, rupture up to super shear ruptures. And here is what I wanted to show you, is that uh, using acoustic sensors this time to, as tracer of the rupture front, we were able in the past to record uh, rupture propagation, propagating faster than the relay wave speed in the length of the fault, which is mode two, and so uh, this, is, this was um, uh, evident for a super shear of rupture. And you can see on the right panel that the red curves, in fact, correspond to a dynamic strain gauges that we were able to record at 10 megahertz, so really fast, to capture, in fact, the uh, fast release of stress during a single instability. So uh, we also show is that what we show in the past is that uh, using this kind of accelerometers uh, and uh, that record the acceleration of uh, particles during uh, stick slip motions, we were able, in fact, to invert uh, to first um, sorry estimate uh, the cohesive zone during uh, these experiments. During these experiments, so the cohesive zone is the size within uh, the one, uh, the distance within uh, the distance uh, along with, in fact, the, 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 the cracks lose this cohesion, if you want. And so uh, you release the stress behind the crack tip. And uh, you can also see that what we did is that uh, the color lines presented on the uh, right panel here correspond to experimental data. And you can see that using uh, semi-numerical semi, uh, model, uh, initially developed to study natural earthquakes, we were able to, uh, to create synthetics that agree the experimental data. So it shows that the physics we have um, describing the, the rupture uh, at the scale of a laboratory is similar to the one that you expect in nature because this model is used to describe natural accelerometers. So it means that what we observe in terms of acceleration of motions in the laboratory during one stick slip event is really what we uh, can get uh, during a natural earthquakes also. So uh, also, uh, I wanted to show Francois, you. Francois, yes. can, yes. I, can I ask you a question? How yes, did sure. you compute this? How did you, because I didn't catch the analogy between the lab and natural earthquakes. How mm -hmm. did you compute the synthetics through a dynamic code or through a kinematic modeling? No, so in that case, it's a model of Denham and Arculeta, so it's a steady state rupture plus model. And therefore, why just fitting the waveform, you can demonstrate that there is the same physics? But because, I mean, for instance, this kind of model, you can also simulate natural accelerometers. For instance, they did it uh, for the Denali earthquakes, I think. So the fact that, in fact, using this model describes the accelerations recorded on our acoustic sensors means that the physics explaining both is really similar. You disagree on that? <laughs> uh. Yeah, I was confused because, for instance, I can reproduce the data through a kinematic model that is just not the real representation. It has nothing to do with the physics. It's simply the fact that I am adopting a reasonable slip distribution and rupture time distribution mm -hmm. that give me the phase, the amplitudes of the waveforms. Yes. But the kinematic model so, has not, uh, nothing to do with the dynamics. Yes, so I, I, I agree with what you said from the natural uh, observations. In that case, in fact, let's say that, you know, the, the waveforms we have um, present the features of the dynamics because the frequency content of the waveforms depends on the size of the cohesion zone, of the stress drop, of the dynamic stress drop, and of the velocity of the rupture front. So it means that you cannot invert these waveforms without considering the real parameters 
uh, that control the dynamics of the cracks during the stick slip events. Yeah, I agree. That means uh, that you have uh, moving sources uh, generating a given yes. spectrum. Okay, but this so does not mean that the physics is the same because what is supporting the moving sources, uh, it is not uh, reproduced by matching the waveforms. But I agree with you. So the, there is a rupture front that is propagating with a given rupture mm -hmm. velocity that is giving a phase and amplitude relationship to the radiated wave field. And this means okay. that the mechanism is the same. But still, the question of which is the physics supporting the crack tip propagation, uh, I believe that uh, should be proven. Okay. Well, uh, very good. <laughs> so I will continue on that. Uh, thanks for your comments. I will think about also, we can discuss later also if you want, for sure. So uh, the second thing that uh, Sanson Marty did uh, with Alex Chuvenel and Arshabat also uh, during his PhD is as using, uh, so based on the same waveform, so it was not exactly this event, but using only the high frequency content uh, recorded on these accelerometers, he used the back projection method to try to track uh, the propagation of the rupture front along the fault. And what he observed is that it was working during the first uh, propagation time, during the, the beginning of the propagation of the cracks. And also the interesting thing is that uh, using uh, the, the, the emissions of these high frequency sources as a tracer of the rupture front, he was able to show in fact that the, the, most of the source looks to be comprised between, uh, within a cohesive zone that was around the centimeters that was corresponding to uh, our previous inversions. So now, what about the control of the rupture speed? So uh, here I'm presenting you uh, some results, a compilation of data that we get uh, in different conditions, but it's not such important at the end. And here you can see on the left panel that I'm presenting uh, uh, laboratory earthquakes propagating at a lot of various uh, rupture speed. And uh, the slower one are uh, the, the blue gray cycles at the top. Uh, and so you can see that uh, they propagate at the rupture velocity around the centimeter per second. And the red cycle correspond to experiments propagating at, uh, at the shear wave speed up to uh, super shear aspect velocity. And uh, what we observe is that, in fact, um, the rupture velocity as a scale of experiment seems to increase with uh, normal stress acting on the fold. And the first uh, thing that we found is that it's probably because if you increase the normal stress on the fault, you reduce the nucleation length. And uh, from the equation of motions, you can predict that the rupture speed is expected to be a function of the relay speed always in mode two in the length of the fault times uh, one minus the ratio between the nucleation length uh, versus the length of the rupture. And so for sure, the smaller is uh, uh, nucleation length in that equation, and the uh, faster will uh, be the acceleration of the rupture uh, through uh, within the, the size of experimental fault. And uh, the, the, the work we did, in fact, with Fabian Barras uh, was to try to write again this equation in terms of energy balance. And in fact, uh, this equation can be written directly uh, using the ratio between the uh, GC and the energy release rate. But you can also uh, write it uh, in the written state framework where you can make, uh, we can write, in fact, this uh, energy balance as a function of the ratio between the initial normal stress, that is the y axis I'm presenting in the, uh, in the left panel, divided by the uh, square of the dynamic stress developed. And what we observe is that if we use this equation, in fact, we can, in fact, predict uh, the general trends of the rupture velocity. And so uh, what does it mean is that the, the rupture velocity and so uh, also the nucleation length in the, in the, in the, in the our experiments, in fact, is a mostly a function of the initial normal stress acting on the fault and the uh, dynamic stress drop. So uh, now the question is that how evolves uh, the energy release rate uh, in our experiments and does the energy release rate and the breakdown work control the dynamics of uh, our ruptures at the scale of a laboratory. And so the first attempt I did 
to compute the fracture energy was that one in 2006, where I mostly integrated the uh, sleep, uh, the stress uh, sleep curves. And what we get from that uh, experimental results is that, in fact, we were able to make a link between uh, socket experiments uh, that are represented by the diamonds, blue diamonds, at the uh, bottom of the uh, panel here. Uh, and so you can see the cycle correspond to experiment conducted at higher and higher stress if you increase, uh, if you uh, switch from blue to red colors. And you can see that we are making the bridge between the socket experiment conducted at low stress by Yonaka uh, toward the uh, intact rocks experiments conducted also by Wong and uh, by Yonaka in 2003 in the review paper he made. And uh, the interesting thing is that in that case, in fact, our energy release rate, no, uh, no, the, let's say the breakdown work, was a function of the normal stress acting on the fault. Because if we increase the normal stress acting on the fault, we induce a larger sleep during the events, and we also uh, increase uh, the stress drop during the events. So uh, the problem is that this breakdown work in that case was mostly uh, related to the activation of uh, uh, weakening mechanism along the fault. And notably, in fact, uh, when you uh, induce a stick sleep events at very high stress along the fault, you uh, induce a complete melting of the fault surface. So uh, Dave Lochner uh, was the first, I think, to show uh, the melting during the events. In fact, I think it was Kwasumi, a Japanese guy, uh, a bit before it, but uh, David Lochner uh, was able to show that at high stress, because of uh, high uh, velocity, sleep velocity occurring during the dynamic events, you are able to produce a rise of temperature that is enough to melt uh, almost complete fault interface. And this uh, melt lubrication induces a very large uh, stress drop and large sleep along the fault. That increase, in fact, is at the origin of the large breakdown work we observed during the event. And it's something that we also uh, have seen with Jérôme Aubry in 2008, where Jérôme, in fact, he was able uh, to uh, create uh, uh, in-situ thermometers using uh, the amorphization, uh, the, the, no, in the graphitization, in fact, of amorphous material uh, placed on the fault interface. And you can see, in fact, that uh, computing uh, the uh, Raman spectra of this material at different confining pressure, in that case, uh, from 45 to 180 MPa normal stress, we were able to show, in fact, that uh, at high normal stress, almost the entire fault surfaces uh, reach uh, the melting temperature of the granite. So at the scale of our experiments, in fact, it looks that the value of the breakdown work is mostly a function of the rise in uh, in uh, in temperature and due to the amount of sleep. And it's also something that we confirm because using the evolution of the temperature at a given distance of the interface during uh, these experiments, we were able, in fact, by using numerical uh, calculations, to invert the amount of energy dissipated into heat. And so uh, here you can see one of the results obtained. And in that case, you can see that the amount of energy uh, we tried to, uh, to fit this change in temperature, it was at five millimeters from the fault, was about uh, six kilojoules per square meter. And uh, if we compare these, uh, these values of energy uh, dissipated into heat to uh, fracture energy that I estimated in the past, what we saw is that in fact, most of this energy uh, looks to correlate with the same value of breakdown work I was estimated. So what does it mean concretely is that in this kind of experiment, the uh, breakdown work that we were able to compute was mostly dissipated in heat uh, along the interface, and we had no clear idea if it was controlling the dynamics of the rupture fault. So I will stop my part uh, here. So here is a summary of the results. So uh, what we were able to show is that at uh, the scale of our experiments, all mode sleep was observed in the laboratory from slow to super shear ruptures. Rupture speed is mostly a function of initial shear stress and of the energy release rate. Um, and then uh, what we mostly have seen is that uh, nucleation occurs for a small value of GC, which is much smaller than the value of breakdown work we computed after the, the experiment. And uh, during stick sleep experiment, breakdown work is at least partially dissipated into it uh, along the fault. And so no, uh, the question is that does it control to rupture dynamics in the scale of the laboratory? And I let uh, the spot to Federica then, uh, and she will talk about a recent experiment she did uh, here.
Yes. Hello. <laughs> so, um, yes. So, what can we learn from Rapture along analog interfaces? This work was done with um, together with Nicola Brantou, Fabian Barras, uh, Mathias Leban, and Marie Violet. And um, so, Francois, in his first part, already pointed out the difference between breakdown work and fracture energy and how. Uh, there is not a unique and shared definition of the two between seismological observations and uh, experimental observations in the framework um, of fracture mechanics. So we wanted to uh, understand deeper the relationship and we did this through uh, stick slip experiments in the lab. So we did experiments in a biaxial configuration. We used the uh, PMMA samples and um, our samples were equipped with shrinkages rosettes placed very close to the um, interface, as close as possible, in order to rupture the to capture the rupture dynamics. And the interface was also equipped with two accelerometers. So what we did, it was quite simple. So uh, the two blocks were pressed one against the other, applying a normal load that was uh, uh, um, increased up to the target value, which, which was then uh, kept constant, and shear stress was increased in order to uh, induce instabilities along the interface. Uh, as we can see in the right figure with all the stick clip series. So what happens during an event? There is a spontaneous uh, propagation of a dynamic rupture, which literally unlocks the interface and allows uh, the two blocks to slip one against the other in a rigid block motion. So in uh, the bottom figure, we can see in black the shear strain evolution during uh, an event. In blue, we can see the acceleration. And in uh, green, you can see the slip evolution the macroscopic slip evolution of the lower block. So you can clearly see that uh, rupture is, uh, is very uh, instantaneous and all acceleration is dissipated during the rupture propagation and only the rupture propagates all the way along the interface, then uh, the two blocks can uh, slip macroscopically. So now if we have a closer look to the um, rupture propagation, we can see here that we clearly capture all the um, passage of the rupture front. And this is the way with which we can have an estimate of the rupture velocity. So by knowing the position of the strain gauges and uh, estimating the arrival time of the rupture front, we can um, measure, the, we can have an idea of the rupture velocity. So our main goal it was to, uh, again, to estimate the fracture energy. So it was shown by Svetlisk and Feinberg in 2014 through experiments that the onset of frictional slip can clearly be uh, described by classical shear crack in mode two. That means that we can study the frictional ruptures in the framework of uh, fracture mechanics. So what we did, it was to um, compare the strain perturbations induced by the rupture uh, but the passage of the rupture front with the theoretical predictions coming from uh, linear, both linear elastic fracture mechanics and cohesive zone uh, model, as was done again by uh, Jenny Feinberg's group and uh, Cameron McCluskey. So here we can, you can see uh, an example of uh, inversion of these parameters. So in blue, black, and uh, green, you can see the strain perturbations in the different directions. And in the solid black, the inversion of the theoretical prediction using a cohesive zone model, and in dashed gray, the prediction using a linear elastic factor me uh, mechanics uh, model. So these two are the main equations um, describing the stress perturbation induced by, by a crack. So in the first equation, we know the strain variation, where here we see the stress. Anyways, we can pass by uh, from strain to stress quite easily. And so we know the left part of the equation. Then uh, this uh, 
uh, function sigma is also uh, known. So all we have to do is to uh, fit, to invert our strain uh, measurements in order to find out uh, the stress intensity factor K2. Once we find K2, we can uh, input it in the in the lower equation to equation to find the fracture energy. So this can be done in the framework of a linear elastic fracture mechanics from which we can estimate the fracture energy. And in the framework of the cohesive zone model, we can invert both fracture energy and the cohesive size. So this is what we get. The, um, the values of uh, fracture energy ranges in between uh, uh, 0.5 and uh, 12 uh, joule per meter squared, which are values comparable to previous studies. And you can see that um, there is a slight increase with applied normal stress, only because the fracture energy is an interface property. So the higher the applied normal load, the higher will be the real contact between the two interfaces, the higher the fracture energy you will need to break them. So uh, with the quasi zone size that we inverted from the quasi zone model, we could then estimate uh, a critical distance through this equation coming from Palmer and Rice. And you can see that the critical distance is scaling also with applied normal stress. And we will use this value uh, later. So this was the estimate of fracture energy that we did in the framework of fracture mechanics. At the same time, we looked at the same events from a different uh, point of view, let's say from the more common or standard approach, uh, at least in the rock mechanics community. So to look at the fault weakening uh, through the shear stress versus slip curve. So the shear stress and the local slip were also obtained by the um, uh, through the strain uh, through the strain gauges. So it's a very local measurement close to the fault. And this is um, an example of a uh, fault weakening that we observed during one event. So we clearly observed uh, two stages of weakening, let's say. A first one that dissipated most of the stress drop, but they dissipated it in a very small uh, slip distance, uh, followed by a second one which dissipated a smaller fraction of stress drop, but in a much larger distance. So now if we, if we take the prediction that we obtained before for the cohesive zone model, we can see that the, the theoretical prediction described uh, quite well, let's say the first weakening stage, but they don't account for the second one. So what we did was to uh, estimate the breakdown work as the integral of the um, shear strain versus slip. So we integrated the whole area here and we defined it as the total breakdown work. And then uh, thanks to the estimate of critical distance that we obtained uh, through the creative zone model, we defined a near tip weakening, so a near tip breakdown work, which is the area here uh, highlighted in blue. So now that we got also our other estimation of breakdown work, we compared it to the previous estimate of fracture energy. And uh, what we observed it was that they were pretty much comparable. So the fracture energy obtained uh, in the framework of fracture dynamics was comparable to the near tip breakdown work obtained just by integrating the shear stress versus slip curve. So that means that the ruptures, the frictional ruptures that we had in our experiments the dynamics of that rupture of those ruptures um, were controlled by the fracture energy of the interface. So now, if we also if we plot the breakdown work and the near tip breakdown work with the final final slip, we could uh, observe that the near tip breakdown work was pretty much constant. Uh, for increasing uh, sleep, while the break total breakdown work was increasing with sleep, as expected by literature and uh, previous works. So the, again, at the scale of our experiments, the rupture dynamics were controlled by the near tip weakening, 
but at the same time our fault was quite small i didn't mention it but it's 20 centimeters small so maybe it was not big enough to um, contain the length scale um, of the second weakening so we wondered what would happen if we had a bigger a big enough uh, fault would the long tail weakening affect also the rupture dynamics so we uh, we studied it through the the radical point of view let's say already Castro in 1966 66 uh, studied the influence of uh, cohesive stress into the definition of a uh, stress intensity factor so what we did it was to adapt its its definition and uh, to include not only a shear stress but a uh, dual weakening uh, uh, cohesive stress as we see here so this is uh, the definition of stress intensity factor which uh, can be split in different terms so the first one k is the stress intensity factor that we would obtain if all the weakenings uh, were um, to occur in a very small region behind the crack tip then we have a second term k tip which is the um, influence that the near tip weakening has on the stress intensity factor and the k tail the influence uh, on the stress intensity factor that the second weakening has on the final stress intensity factor then uh, since uh, the material cannot host infinite stress we need to impose a finite stress at the crank boundary and we do that by uh, imposing the total stress intensity factor to zero and we can obtain this final uh, relationship between all the three um, uh, contributions to the stress intensity factor so if we were to pass now to the energetic point of view we wanted to uh, compute the fracture the energy release rate related to this stress intensity factor we would have different um, uh, conditions let's say if we are at a distance larger than the near tip cohesive zone then the stress intensity factor related to the near tip would not depend on time anymore since we are already out of the cohesive zone, so it would only depend on the fracture energy, on the sorry, on the rupture velocity, and so the energy release rate that we would get would be uh, equal to the fracture energy related to the near tip weakening. Uh, if we were at a distance much larger than the second uh, cohesive zone size, so the long tail cohesive zone size, here again, both the first and the second so the k tip and k tail would uh, become independent of time because we're out of their cohesive zone and so the energy release rate would be uh, almost equal to the sum of the fracture energy associated with the near tip and the long tail weakening but also if we were in between so the distance uh, comprised between the near tip uh, cohesive zone and the long tail cohesive zone then the energy release rate was, would still be a function of both co uh, stress intensity factor. Uh, the near tip stress intensity factor would be independent on time, while the k tail, so the one related to the long tail weakening, would still depend on time and so would increase as you propagate. So that means that the long tail additional weakening can for sure influence the energy release rate and depending on the conditions can also drive the rupture dynamics. So to test these, uh, uh, these observations, we performed some numerical simulations uh, with the last dynamic model that was developed by Nicola Brantou and Fabian Varas. So we used two different constitutive loads. Uh, a first one, let's say a standard slip weakening low that you can see here in uh, gray in the left uh, panel in the scheme and a dual weakening constitutive low that is similar to the one observed in our experiment with the first, um, so again with the near tip weakening and the long tail weakening. Then we also uh, study two different background stress uh, a higher one with a ratio of background stress and peak stress of uh, 0.9 and the second one with this ratio equal to 
So here on the right, you can see uh, the results for the standard case, let's say for the single weakening case. So there is a symmetric crack-like uh, propagation of the rupture with a big increase in slip velocity close to the, um, to the crack edge. So uh, while for the dual weakening case, we can see a very similar dynamics for uh, the early stage of the um, of the propagation while for increasing length for increasing uh, propagation distance there is a second increase in slip velocity that emerges also at the same time there is a much increased slip at the central in the central part of the crack so what was the main difference between the two cases so for the case of higher background stress, you can see that the increase in slip velocity associated with the near tip weakening is much larger than the one associated to the long tail weakening. While in the case, for the case of lower background stress is the opposite. So the, the peak associated with the long tail weakening is larger than the one associated with the with the near tip weakening, and also uh, you can see that rupture velocity is higher. In fact, here the black profiles that describe the dual weakening are uh, ahead of the single weakening ones. So, to better understand this difference and to study the energetics of the ruptures, we estimated again the energy release rate of these ruptures. We followed the um, uh, the method, let's say, already presented in the uh, Baras et al. 2020, in which uh, uh, they fitted the slip velocity profile with the prediction of linear elastic fracture mechanics in order to uh, estimate the energy release rate. And so we did the same for both the single weakening uh, low and the double weakening low. So here on the right, you can see um, the evolution of the energy release rate normalized by the associated fracture energy. So here in gray, you see the energy release rate divided by the fracture energy associated with the near tip weakening. And this was already shown by Fabian Varas in his paper. And uh, you see that it's equal to one. That means that rupture dynamics uh, is completely controlled by the fracture energy uh, related to the weakening. And what you can see in black are the results for the dual weakening. So for the case of higher background stress, the one at the bottom, you see that the ratio between the energy release rate and the uh, fracture energy associated with the long tail weakening is uh, much higher than um, uh, sorry, is much uh, lower than uh, than one. So that means that uh, rupture dynamics uh, is not controlled by the um, long tail beginning. While for the case of lower background stress, you can see that it perfectly tends to one for large enough uh, fault lengths. And this means that the energy balance can be controlled by the energy associated to the long tail beginning. And uh, this might have a consequence also in a case in which we have stress heterogeneities. So for example, if we don't have a uniform background stress, but we have a step in background stress. So in this case, we this is an example with higher background stress in the center and lower uh, afterwards. You can see that rupture nucleates and propagates um, and rupture dynamics uh, is controlled by the near tip weakening. And as soon as the rupture encounters the stress step, let's say the stress decrease, the, the increase in slip velocity is uh, arrested, but rupture uh, can still propagate thanks to the long tail weakening that um, helped the rupture to overcome the barrier. And in the right panel, you can see also the um, energetics so the ratio between again the stress uh, energy the energy release rate and the fracture energy associated with the long tail weakening and you can see that as soon as rupture uh, overpass the barrier the this ratio tends to one 
So that means that rupture uh, becomes controlled by the long tail weakening. Uh, so the conclusion is that the near deep propagation is driven by the material property, that the rupture velocity in function of the initial stress and of the energy release rate. The complete breakdown work scales with sleep and depends on friction weakening, and the complete work breakdown work uh, can control the full dynamics of the rupture tip for sufficiently long falls. And now I will give again the floor to Francois for less conclusions. Maybe you can just put the slide. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> So here, in fact, uh, what we tried is so uh, when we saw that there is this kind of difference between the fracture energy from linear elastic fracture mechanics and the uh, frictional uh, breakdown work uh, due to uh, frictional motions that we can observe also in high velocity friction experiments, for instance, that you all may know. Uh, we tried to compute several values for uh, lateral earthquakes. So here you can see the scaling that we can get uh, uh, for the breakdown work for different uh, laboratory experiments, different mining-induced events, fluid-induced events, and natural earthquakes. And uh, the color of the symbol corresponds to a different population obtained along the same fault, same experimental fault, same mines, on, or same uh, area uh, uh, where people injected fluids. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you looked at the uh, global evolutions, as has been shown by uh, many other authors, in fact, the general scaling seems to uh, be a power law of an exponent of, uh, let's say, one or two. But uh, in fact, if you looked at uh, different populations, so if you go, can move to the next slide. Uh, yes, so... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, but that's why it's good. <laughs> so uh, in fact, the, so if you looked at uh, events uh, that are relatively small, what you can see is that uh, all uh, population of events up to a, a seismic slip of uh, one centimeter, for instance, they seems to follow a power two dependence between breakdown work and sleep. While in fact, if you looked at a larger earthquakes, in fact, it looks that it's more followed, uh, it's more following uh, linear relations. And these dashed lines, in fact, uh, these dashed uh, black lines correspond to uh, theoretical predictions coming from a uh, linear elastic uh, crack model that has been developed, for instance, by, uh, by uh, Raoul Manariaga in that case, but also if you take the model of Brun, what you can see is that it's expected to be linear. So uh, it's not the case for uh, some population of these events where, in fact, we find a power two relationships. And these power two relationships can come directly from a uh, linear sleep weakening, because if you integrate a linear weakening law uh, with sleep, in fact, you expect a power 2 dependence. It's also the case for Moritan State. People did the exercise recently where they find this power 2 experiment. So uh, from natural observation, the explanation can come from something else. If you go to the next slide, uh, if you, please. In fact, you can see here, in fact, uh, the evolution of uh, the average sleep for each event as a function of the source radius. And this relation, in fact, is expected to increase as a linear function. So the average sleep is supposed to follow the dashed lines uh, on the right panel, uh, because the larger will be the source radius, the larger will be the crack, and the larger will be the uh, energy released in the, in the medium. And uh, it's not what we see from natural data. In fact, what you see from natural data is for the same uh, source radius, we see that uh, uh, the sleep can increase if you increase the stress drop. So what does it mean is that, in fact, uh, probably some of the ruptures in nature are finite, which uh, induce an increase of sleep uh, for a same similar uh, um, rupture area, for a similar rupture area. And this is just due to the fact of free surfaces that uh, induce, as we can see, for instance, in experiments, uh, more release of uh, stress by, by uh, an increase in sleep. So uh, to finish, so if you go to the last slide, uh, what we did is that we tried to see uh, how we look the evolution of Braden work as sleep if we take a multiple a constitutive law uh, that is composed of three different uh, sleep reckoning uh, distances that correspond to three different distinct, uh, distinct mechanisms that we know happen at different length scales uh, in the lab and probably in nature. So for instance, flash heating, multiplication, and thermal decomposition. Uh, 
And if you do it, uh, so if you move that, in fact, what you can see is that the red lines correspond to the uh, predictions assuming this kind of constitutive law for different value of initial stress, uh, of initial stress acting on the fold. Because in that case, what you will uh, observe is that the Braden work will be a function of the size of our space because of the, of the amount of final sleep, but also of the initial stress. So it looks that uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at this curve, it's allowed to jump for one population of power two exponent uh, events to another one. So it means that, in fact, uh, if you increase the sleep, maybe uh, all kind of earthquakes can follow the same constitutive law. But if you uh, switch from one uh, weakening mechanism to another one, uh, you can uh, see different power two exponents. So thanks you for your attention. I think we will finish here. And we were a bit long, but we hope uh, you uh, get some things and that you have some questions. <laughs> Okay, Alex, thanks, uh, Francois, with the... Uh...